for coming tonight, and uh, and uh, thank you for giving me a, an excuse to come to my old stomping grounds. I I uh, I grew up on a dairy farm just a few miles up that way, uh, just off of, of Highway E, and. Uh, I'm a 1978 graduate of Old Whippy High School, so uh, this is where I spent my childhood. Curtis has changed a little bit since I was here. As I recall, it was about 150 people uh, at the time, so it's, it's grown a little bit, but it certainly has, has developed out here by the highway in a way that, uh, that I neither foresaw or, uh, or, or saw it coming. You know, I, I, I tell you, I, I wrote this book recently, and, and the first chapter is titled Clues from Clark County. And so it really starts there, because most of what I know about the world and most of what I know about politics and everything about my own life's path was really shaped here. Uh, and I, I tell a story in chapter one uh, and I know some of you have bought the book, and so you're going to get this story twice, and I apologize for that. But I have to tell the story anyway. Uh, when I was growing up here, the late 1970s was a pretty tough time in the, in the farming business. And it's not a coincidence that shortly after I got out of high school, they started making all these films in Hollywood about the farm crisis. And they started having farm aid concerts and musicians were coming together to raise money for, for farmers. Uh, I, I was watching, living through that, that period. It, it was tough times. And, and uh, when I was in high school, uh, it was in the fall, we were having a horribly wet fall and we were having a hard time harvesting crops. And, uh, and you know, just a few weeks before we really got into harvesting corn, uh, you know, silage, uh, a neighbor of ours hung himself in their shed. A fellow named Les Sturz. Uh, he was, a, actually his son was Les Sturz. Um, his dad hung himself in the shed because the bankers were about to foreclose on them and, and kick them off their land. And, and so the family basically got that death sentence weeks before we really got into peak harvest season. And uh, it was a, a matter of time, the days were numbered before the, they would come in and sell out the herd and, the, and all the machinery and remove the family from the farm. And like I said, we were having a horribly wet fall. We were burying tractors up to the axle. And, and what should I see? Weeks after uh, Lester's dad was buried, down the road comes an orange Alice Chalmers tractor. Lester pulls into our field, hooks a chain to our tractor, and helps pull us through the field so we can, so we can harvest that corn. And of course, we return the favor in the weeks to come and help him get his crops in. Uh, and then a short time after that, the family was removed from that farm. That, that shaped me forever. Uh, Lester's didn't have a high school diploma, nor did my dad. Uh, my dad had an eighth grade education. Les couldn't have had much more than that. Uh, but they were, they were my most important teachers, with all due respect to Owen Withy High School. They taught me more about, about compassion and more about the common good and more about thinking we first rather than me first than anybody else I've ever encountered in my life. And that shaped my politics. It wasn't the only thing that shaped my politics, but that shaped my politics significantly. It was just, just the lessons I learned there. And I kind of look at society today and I wonder where the hell that ethic has gone. Where that idea of looking out for each other has gone. And, and I, I, see, I see at the Capitol a really self-centered and selfish politics that's taken hold. 
And I don't say that as a criticism of just one party. I say that as a criticism of the whole system. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, for those of you who are loyal Democrats, faithful partisans, I have to tell you some things that I think will stink. And you probably won't like hearing them, but I'm going to say them anyway, because I think it's important for us to face facts. We have reached a point in our nation's history where both parties are failing America. And I am not one of those people who believes that the two parties are really one. That they, you, you can't tell the difference between the two parties. And you hear that from people, that, that it's just two wings of the same party, or it's really just one, one party, not two. That's nonsense. There are significant differences between the parties. Significant differences. And they are failing America in different ways, but they're failing us nevertheless. And that has led us to a moment of great crisis. And, and we are in the fight of our lives. We face conditions today that have not been faced in our lifetimes. We face threats to democracy, threats to the American way that have not been faced in living memory. And, and at that time of crisis, we have two parties that are not up to the task, that aren't doing what we need done here in, in, in this state and, and in our country. And the two parties' differences are many. Their similarities are few. But I'll tell you, one of the things they've got in common is that they're joined at the billfold. And that is a condition that we have to fight against with every fiber of our being. I track money for a living. For 15 years, I've tracked political money. And I was just having a conversation over in Owen earlier today. And one of the things I pointed out is that if you look at where political money is coming from, regardless of party, if you look at the money being raised by our state legislators, two-thirds of their money, on average, comes from people who cannot vote for them. Two-thirds of the money they raise come from people who cannot vote them into office because they don't live in their districts. Some legislators get much more than two-thirds. A few get less, but on average, two-thirds of the money comes from people who can't vote for them. And one of the things that Clark County is up against is the reality that in a state with about 900 zip codes, most of the political money comes from 32 of those zip codes. And almost all of those zip codes are around the suburban periphery of Milwaukee or Dane County. And, of course, an, a growing amount of money isn't even coming from those donors in Wisconsin. It's coming from out of state. It's coming from people who can't vote in any of our state's elections. We're seeing increasing amounts of money coming in. In fact, Governor Walker has gotten more than half of his money from people who can't vote in this statewide election because they don't live in Wisconsin. And that leads us, I think, to a, a great crisis. The founders, when they designed this system, wrote the Federalist Papers before they wrote the Constitution. And they wrote the Federalist Papers under pseudonyms. They wrote them anonymously because they faced the threat of hanging. If it was discovered, who wrote this sedition? Now, historians believe that the words I'm about to share with you were written by James Madison. They were written under the pseudonym Publius. But it was thought to be Madison who wrote that we should have a government dependent on the people alone. Dependent on the people alone. Those were his words. I don't care what party you say you belong to. You cannot, with a, with a clear conscience and with open eyes, reach the, conclusions, reach the conclusion that we have a government dependent on the people alone. The truth is, our elected officials have conflicting dependencies. They have competing dependencies. And that is a corruption. 
of the design of our democracy. People, people sometimes grind their teeth or they, or they flinch or sometimes they vent when I use the word corruption. Ah, you, can't, you can't call them corrupt. But we have elected officials operating in and accepting and refusing to change a system that is a corruption of the design that we were given by our founders. They designed a system dependent on the people alone, and the truth is we have elected officials in both parties who have conflicting dependencies. They are not dependent on the people alone. Two-thirds of their money comes from people who can't vote for them. They are dependent on their donors. And if you total up all the donors, and I mean all the donors, who give to all the politicians, you get to barely 2% of the population. You get to a number barely equal to 2% of Wisconsin's population. And that's not to say, I'm not saying that the donors are 2% of the population. The donors represent a number of people equal to 2% of our population. A lot of them come from outside Wisconsin but they give to influence elections here. And, and so clearly what we have is elected officials who have, much, have no choice but to cater to those donors, to take their cues from those donors, do the bidding of those donors, which means that they cannot be dependent on the people alone. They cannot represent the people alone. They have other interests to represent other interests to cater to. That, I'm sorry, but that is a corruption of the design of our system. And that is not a partisan problem. That is not one side's doing. That is something that both sides have to come to terms with. And it's a, it's a problem for all of us, regardless of our partisan stripes. And so, one of the things I say when I go to audiences, again, regardless of political stripe, is that we do today have two parties that are failing us. They're failing us in different ways, but they're failing us. We've got one party that is scary and another that is scared. And that's something that we all have to come to terms with. You know, it's interesting. I've used that line probably a thousand times now. One party that's scary and another that's scared, and I've yet to be asked by a single person in a single audience which party is which. <laughs> the Republican Party has been corrupted. The party of Lincoln, the party of Teddy Roosevelt, the party of Dwight Eisenhower used to be dedicated to the idea of creating opportunity for all. It is now a party dedicated to taking care of the rich and protecting the interests of the rich. But the Democratic Party is a party that used to be dominant in Clark County. When I was growing up, this gentleman right here was representing this county in the state legislature. And Tom admonished me for referring to him as a moderate Democrat. And he's right, of course. I, I, the only thing I could plead after pleading guilty was to say that I was comparing him to Frank Nicolet. <laughs> that he was a more moderate Democrat than Frank Nicolet. Because no true or progressive has ever served in the state legislature than Frank Nicolet. Right. You, you, can't, you couldn't have been more progressive or more liberal than Frank Nicolet. And Clark County sent Frank Nicolet and sent Tom Harnish to the state capitol for years representing this area. And, and I can't tell you how many times that people come up to me in Madison. I, I have to live in Madison now because that's where the state capital is and that's where our offices are. And so I, I have people in Madison coming up to me all the time and saying, how come people in, in your neck of the woods are so stupid? Why, why, are, they, why are they always voting against their own economic self-interest? They, they're baffled by what they see as as the ignorance and stupidity of people in places like this. And, and, uh, and I write about this in chapter one of the book. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll spoil a little bit of chapter one and, and share this with you. 
I try to explain what I see as very clear logic being exhibited by people in this area that the Democratic Party has not come to terms with. There is a logic, a solid logic, to the, the current behavior of voters here. And I know that people will say, well, it's all been wedge issues. It's been social issues like abortion or guns. That's what's driven people away from the Democrats toward the Republicans. I think there's something more at work here. My dad, as I said, had an eighth grade education. He was not a political man. I was asked earlier by somebody if he had been involved in the NFO, if he was a politically active farmer. I said, my dad wasn't political at all. I didn't grow up in a political family. They were dairy farmers. They farmed. That's what they did. And, and, and you know, but my dad would always tell me that the Democrats were the party of the poor and the Republicans were the party of the rich. That's how he made sense out of the political world. That's how he saw things. He wouldn't be able to make heads or tails out of Clark County today. Scott Walker winning, winning Clark County by over 30 percentage points in 2012, one of the five poorest counties in Wisconsin. He wouldn't be able to make any sense of that. Because he's, he always told me the Democrats were the party of the poor and the Republicans were the party of the rich. He grew up in the Depression. He measured every single politician he ever looked at by how much they resembled FBI. Franklin Roosevelt shaped his politics for a lifetime because of his family's experience in the Great Depression. But you know, my dad would always tell me about all of those de Depression-era policies. He would tell me about the WPA and the CCC. He would tell me, and, and of course, he, he then went off and fought in World War II and people came back and there was the GI Bill. And there was rural electrification, which, which changed the rural landscape and there was the interstate highway system that allowed people to get products to, to markets that they never could have contemplated were open to them. And so for him, there are all these things that the Democratic Party and, and some Republicans like Dwight Eisenhower did that touched every family, that made a difference in their lives. And one of the things I've asked people as I go out and talk is, Tell me, what is the modern-day equivalent? What policy that is in place today is the modern-day equivalent of rural electrification? What policy has been put in place today? What, what, what advance has been made that is the modern-day equivalent of the interstate highway system? What has been done today by today's politicians? What have they produced that is the modern-day equivalent of the GI Bill or the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, or the CCC? the Civilian Conservation Corps. What are the, the modern-day equivalents of those kinds of policies? And of course, people say, well, there ain't any. People in Clark County aren't stupid. I think there, there's, a, there's a calculation that's been made. If government's not going to do anything that makes our lives better, if, if government's not going to change things for the better for us, then we want to keep government as small as possible. If it's not really on our side, then keep it as small as possible. And what becomes the default option for voters who have come to that conclusion? It's going to be the Republican Party. Whether they deserve it or not, they become the default option for people who want to keep government as small as possible. And so there's a clue right there in Clark County. That's the title of the very first chapter, Clues from Clark County. There's a clue right there about, about what has to be done to win back people who have become so disillusioned. But, you know, there's great opportunity for the Democrats because the other party is dedicated to serving the rich. It's not the party of Eisenhower. It's not the party of Teddy Roosevelt. It's not the party of Lincoln anymore. And, and so we are at a point, a maddening, exasperating point in our history where most people... And again, a lot of you are going to cringe, maybe be angry when I say this, but most people, most Americans, feel doomed to holding their noses and choosing between what they regard as the lesser of two evils when they go to the ballot box. They feel that both parties are failing them. And they feel politically homeless. And I pick that up everywhere I go, 
But you can also look at Gallup polling or Pew Research, or you can look at any of the major media organizations polling. And what you'll find is that a bigger percentage of Americans refuse to identify either as Democrats or as Republicans than at any time in the last three quarters of a century. The ranks of the politically homeless are larger than we've seen in three quarters of a century. What that suggests to me is we are at a moment that cries out for political innovation, that cries out for what I call a first party movement. We've all been brainwashed or trained to think that we have three options as voters or as citizens. The first option is whatever the two major parties offer us up. And for most Americans, they don't like what's being offered. And they feel like they're holding their noses and choosing between the lesser of two evils. So they long for door number two. They, they think, hey, why don't we start a third party? Well, the problem with third parties is that they always finish third. We have a two-party system. We're not a parliamentary democracy. We're not a system where competing factions come together to form coalition governments, where a, where a fifth or sixth party could join forces with, a, a, with a, a second party and actually become the ruling coalition. We don't have that system. We have a two-party system. So whether it's Ross Perot one time or Ralph Nader another, that path has always been a dead end. It ends up leaving voters feeling let down. And, and they feel deflated. Which leads them to what they think is their third and final option, which is withdrawal. In the politics of resignation, you have to admit, are endemic to our society at this current moment. There are so many people who have simply thrown up their hands, headed for the sidelines, and said, I'm out. I'm done. If my vote isn't really going to make much of a difference, if my voice isn't going to be heard, I'm, I'm withdrawing. The problem, the problem is, is that we've been trained to think that those are our three options. Where, whereas there's actually a fourth door. We've been taught not to even recognize its existence. But there is a fourth door. And our great-grandparents and our great-great-grandparents actually found it and on more than one occasion opened it and what they found behind it was transformational. What they found behind it was landscape altering. It changed the face of American politics. And I describe it in the book as, as a first party movement rather than a third party movement. Third parties organize on the fringes, to the left of the Democrats or to the right of the Republicans. They try to clip the wings of the parties. The first party movement goes straight for the heart. It seeks to compete for the affections of all voters. A third party's goal is to have three or more parties at the end in a two-party system. It never works. A first party movement seeks to make one party that's actually worth a damn, one party that truly owes its allegiance to the people. And what fascinates me is every time a first party movement has been tried and has succeeded in America, and it has worked, the first step has always been the establishment of a new political identity. I talk about two such instances in history with deep roots right here in Wisconsin. The first came in the time of slavery. At the time of slavery, we had two major parties in America in our two-party system, the Democratic Party and the Whig Party. Both were basically pro-slavery parties. And there was a growing abolitionist movement. People were feeling politically homeless. They felt they weren't being represented. They went into a little white schoolhouse in Ripon, Wisconsin. They went into that building calling themselves Democrats or Whigs. Some refused to call themselves either. They called themselves free soilers. A whole bunch of them called themselves free soilers. And they came out of that building united in calling themselves Republicans. They established a new political identity. That identity and the accompanying agenda drove the Whig Party to extinction. Interestingly, at the end, there were not three parties in America, in American politics. There still were two dominant parties. It's just one had a different identity. Then, I talked about this on Saturday at Fighting Bob Fest. 
Roughly a generation later, a Republican leader offered a 35-year-old attorney a bribe to fix a case. That attorney's name was Robert M. LaFollette. And LaFollette was so offended, he was a Republican. Bob LaFollette was a Republican. He reached the conclusion that his party had grown corrupt. And what did he do? He fashioned himself a new political identity. He stopped calling himself a Republican, and he started calling himself a progressive. And he and his allies built a movement that ended up not extinguishing one party, but transforming both. Both parties had to embrace the progressive identity and the progressive agenda that came along with it. Teddy Roosevelt ran for president in the United States as a progressive on the Republican ticket. Some years later, Woodrow Wilson ran as a progressive on the Democratic ticket. Both parties felt they had no choice but to reconnect with the people, go where the people were, and the people had embraced this progressive identity and the agenda that came along with it. And we saw sweeping reform that changed the landscape across the entire policy frontier. We saw railroad regulation. We saw insurance reform. Wisconsin saw the first system of taxation based on ability to pay. There, you know, there was worker, uh, worker rights were, were strengthened. Child labor laws were enacted. The first system of workers' compensation anywhere in America created right here in Wisconsin. The first system of vocational, technical, and adult education created right here in Wisconsin. All an outgrowth of that progressive movement. And it was Republicans and Democrats alike who felt like they had no choice but to give the people what they wanted. And here we are stuck. So I'll end my presentation tonight the way I, I, I did it at the Wisconsin Farmers Union State Convention. I don't even know what possessed me to do this, but it did inspire the title of my book. But when I was talking to 250 farmers at the Farmers Union Convention, I, I said, how many of you own a donkey? And much to my surprise, not a single hand in the audience went up. Not one. And they said, oh, come on, surely one of you still got to have a donkey on your land somewhere, and, not, and no one did. And, and so I said, how many of you own an elephant? And of course, no hands go up. And I said, oh, all right, how many of you own a pair of blue jeans? And every single hand in that audience goes up. And I said, all right, now what would be a more fitting symbol a more apt representation of us as a people, a donkey, an elephant, or a pair of blue jeans. And what would better distinguish us from the suits on Capitol Hill and Wall Street and K Street where all the lobbyists hang out? What would better distinguish us as a people from those who seek to lord over us, a donkey, an elephant, or a pair of blue jeans? And the reaction I got from that audience is what caused me to call the book what it's called, Blue Jeans in High Places. We're, we're, our politics are caught in a time war. Even the major parties have symbols that date back to the 19th century, for crying out loud. And the same doggone political cartoonist, Thomas Nass, gave both parties their symbols. He gave the Republicans the elephant and the Democrats the donkey. What do those symbols possibly have to do with modern day American life? How is it relevant to our lives today? And every time when people compelled parties that were failing them to reconnect meaningfully with the people, the first step they took was to establish a new political identity. I think the conditions that we face today are so eerily reminiscent of the Gilded Age, the age of the robber barons. The threats to democracy and to our way of life are so virtually identical to those that existed in the 1890s, I think we've reached another moment where citizens need to forge a new political identity. Not a third party, but a new political identity that can be used to, to rally people around an agenda that will compel one or both of the major parties to reconnect with us meaningfully. And I think that's the the challenge of our lifetimes is to take a system that has again fallen into disrepair 
to take parties that are no longer serving us the way that they ought to be serving us, and to, to take it within, within our, our own, in, in our own hands, and to understand that we have it in our power to remake the political landscape. We have it within our power to force parties that are failing us to start serving us again. And when people say, well, I, yeah, it can't work, there's too much money, or there's too much this, or too much that, our great-grandparents were up against the Koch brothers of their age. They were up against Standard Oil. They were up against the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies. They, they were up against timber barons and railroad barons, and they beat them. And I refuse to believe, I absolutely refuse to believe that we are less able than our great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents were. We got more money than they had, we got more education than they had, we got infinitely more means of communication than they had. I refuse to believe that they could accomplish what they accomplished and we can't repeat history. It, it, it defies logic to think that we are somehow less capable than they were given all of what we have going for us today. And so I think we've come to that moment where we've got to sort of face facts and face up to what, what isn't working for us, even within our own party, whatever, what, whatever party you belong to. There are mainstream Republicans who feel politically homeless. They feel their party's been stolen from, from them. There are mainstream Democrats who feel politically homeless because it, did, it, it didn't work for them either. When conditions like that arise, it's time for people to take matters into their own hands. It's time for us to be as imaginative and as innovative as those past generations were. And, um, and with that, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving me a chance to come back here home and, uh, and, and visit my old stomping grounds. Thanks for giving me a chance to share these ideas with you. Um, if you want a book, I brought some along with me. You can you can certainly buy one. Um, but uh, but I hope I've, I've given you some some food for thought, and I hope that these seeds are are ones that can be planted and that we can grow into something that can that can be as impactful <coughs> on the political landscape as the, the things that that past generations did for us. We got to do those things for our kids and our grandkids. Uh, because they, there were others who did those things for us. Thank you. Your turn. Your turn. Questions, comments, criticisms. Yeah. Mike, I was wondering if you know how much the criminal defense fund that our governor's got to spend so far. I heard 650000 That's probably been five weeks ago. Well, uh, if, you, uh, if you combine the first John Doe investigation and the second John Doe investigation, if you go all the way back to 2011, it, it's, it's upwards of a million dollars now that's been transferred Either, either transferred from campaign funds into a legal defense fund, or has been spent directly from the campaign account for attorneys who are representing the governor in these John Doe investigations. So your figure is probably correct as far as the, as far as the legal defense fund alone goes, but there's also been hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of payments directly out of the campaign uh, two attorneys who are involved with the John Doe investigation defense. So it's, it's now um, either very close to or exceeding seven figures, about a million dollars. Yeah? All right. Uh, one of the topics that was a, a hot topic in the Fighting Bob Fest this weekend was the recent uh, court decision uh, lifting the injunction against the yes. voting. Registration yes. stuff. And how how can we best deal with that? Do you think? I mean, we're up here and we don't have a lot of that problem in terms of getting people registered. Right. And stuff, but how can we help in other parts of the state 
And what can we do to help with that? Well, you know, the, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals had a three-judge panel issue this most recent ruling. Um, one option, and I've actually tried to plant the seed, is one option is to, is to conclude that the legal options haven't been exhausted yet. Some people have said, well, this could be, this could be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court would clearly agree with the three-judge panel. And so, and so the, it's a dead end. But actually, you can you can ask the full Seventh Circuit to review the decision of the three judge panel. It's called an on bank uh, uh, review or an on bank appeal. There are ten judges in the Seventh Circuit. Um, three were chosen to rule on this case. The other seven could join in, and they all could look at this. And and they could issue a stay, which would prevent the turmoil of having the law go into effect now at such a late date. The problem with it going into effect now is, is that there already have been absentee ballots sent out and, and returned. People have actually cast their votes without being asked to show a photo ID. And so you, we're in now in a situation where we could have people treated in two very different ways. We could have some voters required to show an ID and other voters casting ballots without showing an ID because of the very late date. Um, so I, I think there are other legal options that could at least be explored. Aside from that, I think what's really important is for citizens to, to talk seriously with, with coworkers and friends and neighbors and try to engage them about what voter ID policies are really all about. They've been sold as a way of preventing voter fraud. I have yet to become familiar with a single case, one single case of in-person identity fraud in a Wisconsin election. If there's somebody out there who knows of an instance of in-person identity fraud in a Wisconsin election, I want them to come forward and show me that case. I'm unfamiliar with a single case. And it's that form of voter fraud that is the only kind of fraud that could possibly be prevented by a voter ID requirement. This policy is about voter suppression, pure and simple. It, it has a political aim. It has nothing to do with preventing voter fraud because there hasn't been any of the kind of voter fraud that this policy could possibly prevent. People have, some people have said, well, voter fraud is very rare. And so this is a, a solution in search of a problem. It's more than very rare. The kind of voter fraud, I'm familiar with voter fraud cases. They almost always have involved a convicted felon voting, and they thought that once released from, from prison, or one, once they completed the terms of their incarceration and were back out working in the community, they assumed their voting rights were restored. And they're not until all of the conditions of their sentence including any, any probation or parole. Until all of that's completed, their voting rights aren't restored. So I'm familiar with a number of cases where felons, for example, have voted, I think un unknowingly or unwittingly, and, and they actually were committing voter fraud. I'm not familiar with a single case of in-person identity fraud, a person coming in and voting as somebody else. So it's really important that people come fully to terms with, with what this proposed solution would solve. It, it doesn't address any case that I know of. What it does do is it erects barriers for participation for men, particularly senior citizens who may not drive anymore, uh, young people who are highly mobile and may not yet have driver's licenses for that matter, and, and uh, minority populations who are much, much more likely than the general population not to have photo IDs. So poor people, racial minorities, young people, senior citizens are, are particularly vulnerable populations. They'll, they'll be the ones who are most heavily impacted. So you might say, well, we don't have many people who will be impacted. Well, there, there will be a lot of folks in many communities who are impacted, and it will make a difference in the election. This is, this is about voter suppression. And people have to, have to be able to see that. And if they can't see it, they need to be challenged to come up with an example of a case of in-person identity fraud 
that has, has actually occurred here in Wisconsin. I have, I have yet to see one, and I've done a lot of research on this topic. We have no cases in Clark County, nothing. I don't, I don't see a single case in the entire state of Wisconsin. And I've, I've seen some loose talk, I've seen allegations during various elections, but when investigated, the cases fell apart. They, there has not been a case of prosecutable in-person identity fraud. The reason, I think, is because it is such an idiotic thing to do, in-person identity fraud. To gain one extra vote, you're taking the risk of going to prison for a very long time. It is an incredibly stupid act if you were to do that, which is why it's, it's exceedingly rare across the country and apparently not existent in Wisconsin. You gotta be a total idiot to try to impersonate somebody else at the polling place because if you get caught, you're going to prison. To get one vote? How often is that gonna make a difference in an election? If you wanna rig an election, Voter fraud is not the way to do it. Election fraud is the way to do it. Corrupt the way the ballots are counted, or if they're counted. Election fraud is the way to, to rig an election if you want to if you want to cheat. You don't do it one vote at a time by having people impersonate other people at the polling place. I was just going to say that the Amish community is affected up here. Good point. Excellent point. And you know, a lot of people say, well. Yeah, if, it, if people didn't hear, he, he said that the Amish or Mennonite communities would be more, more impacted than the general population by this kind of a requirement. And you know, one of the things you hear is people say, well, how hard is it to get a photo ID? If you don't happen to have, if you don't drive and don't happen to have a driver's license, then, then you've got you've to jump through all the hoops. You, you've got to prove you've got to offer proof of, of your birth circumstances. If you're married and, and you no longer have your maiden name, you've got to produce a, a marriage license, a marriage certificate to show that you, you know, that, that you were married and changed your name. And each one of these steps, particularly now when this is being imposed on people here at the last second in this election, for people to jump through those hoops and then be able to actually get the ID and then, and then uh, actually vote, uh, is, is going to be a burden that many will, will, not, will, will, will not take on. They'll, they'll simply skip voting, which is the intent, of course. I know a lot of young people that they move a lot and they don't get their driver's license changed. And if they go to register to vote and they are, their driver's license is at the wrong address, they're not going to get to register. Yeah, and then, you know, and that's then, my son. And then, and then, you've, got to be, you, then you've got to offer all kinds of proof of, of your current residence and all of that. And, and how, that's, that's why I say that young people are a particularly vulnerable population because young people are way more mobile than the general population. They're moving much more frequently. So the likelihood that their current address is also on their driver's license is much less than with most of us. If you have bought a house and you've lived in that house for 30 years or whatever, your address hasn't changed, their address is changing a lot. And that makes them a particularly vulnerable population. And that, that is understood by, by those who want to suppress the vote. And, and, uh, and, and uh, so these policies need to be seen for what they are. They are voter suppression, pure and simple. Well, I believe, I believe that what they should be doing is the county clerks should be in charge of voter registration cards. I think it should be individual. They have the list. They purge the list. It's, you're leaving it up to the DMV to yeah. handle this operation. And I, I believe that the 72 county clerks in the county should be issuing voter identification cards in their form of voter registration. I mean, it's held to get on the tax rolls, but it's awfully hard to get on the voter registration rolls. You know, one of the things that frustrates me about all of this is we're, we're really defending, we're, we're put in a position of trying to defend the old election system. What we really should be talking about is why in this, in this modern age of computers and and in this digital world, why don't we have automatic voter registration? It's, it's eminently doable. To, think, think about how much data exists for every single person in the country. There's no reason why when you reach a, when you reach a voting age, you couldn't be automatically registered. It automatically show up on a national voting database. Uh, 
we're, we're making people continue to jump through hoops that technologically are not necessary to jump through anymore. And there, there again, what that makes me suspect is that there, there are people in the political establishment that want people to have to jump through hoops when it, when it could be made much simpler, much easier. We should be having a conversation in our society about automatic voter registration. The technology is obviously there. Think about all the data that's being collected on all of us. And you don't, you don't think that, that they know when you become voting age and, and where you live? Changing the topic. Yeah. Uh, when you talked about, uh, Pete was talking about, you know, where money is. The Wisconsin Economic Development Council and some of the stuff that's going on there with the uh, walk. Well, um, I, I'm actually going to be appearing at a press conference tomorrow afternoon at the Capitol calling for the governor to step down as chairman of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Um, I, I, we're not doing it alone. We're doing it with others as, as well. But, um, you know, that, that agency is a train wreck, and, and it really should be put out of its misery. Um, it, it, it's been one embarrassing revelation after another, bad audits, lost you know, funds that they can't really account for, uh, assistance being given to companies that outsource the jobs, one, one embarrassing revelation after another, and, and really a dismal failure when it comes to, to end results. So uh, here, the thing that, my view is that when a government program doesn't work, it should be ended. If a government program is not working, it should be ended. It shouldn't be, be maintained in perpetuity. And to me, that is a conservative principle. That is a Republican principle. When, if government programs don't work, get rid of them. Well, this program clearly doesn't work. It, it hasn't worked from the beginning. It has only caused embarrassment for the state. It hasn't, it hasn't produced results. And, and to me, they're, they're, regardless of partisanship, people should look at a program and say, that one's not working. Get rid of it. Save the money. Use the money for a more uh, constructive purpose. Don't keep throwing money down rat holes. That, that is solid Republican thinking. And that's, this is an example of what I mean when I say the party of Lincoln and of Teddy Roosevelt and of Dwight Eisenhower is not their party anymore. It is not a party dedicated to creating opportunity for all. It's, it's a party dedicated to protecting the rich. And this agency is doling out corporate welfare, sometimes not even being able to account for the corporate welfare they dole out, certainly not getting results for the corporate welfare that they're doling out. And, and so why do you say but what we do but what we do see is that 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 corporate welfare is going to to interests that provide large sums of campaign money and and you know there again that brings us back to that corruption of the of the design of our system uh, we're not thinking about whether this agency serves the the greater good for the state of Wisconsin, it's, it's serving a few that supply a lot of political donations, it's helping them, I, I fail to see the results it's producing for all of the rest of us. So, it's working well for exactly what it was designed for. Yeah, you know, and, and I, but I'm not comfortable with, <laughs> with, 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 with accepting that sort of outcome. Still, I think it always has to come down to if a government program works, fine. If it doesn't work, kill it. It's correct. Get rid of it. But, but yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, it's serving a political purpose. It's not, it's not serving a good economic development purpose, and that's sad. What are your predictions for the gubernatorial race? Or do you have an idea of who's going to come out ahead? And, well, actually, the other question I had, too, is just uh, what are we going to see as far as political ads in the next six weeks, and how, how bad is it going to get? Um, here's a measure of how bad it's going to get. I have a 15-year-old. 
you stay to the question. Oh, he asked if I had any predictions for the outcome of the November gubernatorial election, and then, and then also asked uh, about what, what I would expect in terms of ads over the course of the final weeks. Here's one measure of, of, of uh, how bad it, it gets. I have a 15-year-old son. He was playing a video game on his Xbox, and up pops a Scott Walker ad on his Xbox. So they're, they're, they don't just put these ads on, on television stations anymore. They're into Yeah, they're looking for every possible place they can stash an ad, in, including Xboxes, apparently, video game equipment. Uh, there's political ads coming up. Uh, so yeah, we're going to see a blizzard of ads. One of the one of the things that again I think cries out for for citizen intervention and and citizen creativity is the reality of what this television age is doing to us as a society. If airlines advertised the way politicians do, would anybody fly in this country? Could you imagine if Coca-Cola started running ads about Pepsi, you know, claiming that, that Pepsi employees urinate in the vats or, or that there were rats spotted in the factory? I mean, would anybody buy those beverages anymore? But we've grown to tolerate political advertising that's that poisonous. And, and, and I, I think what it ends up doing is, is you know, negative advertising does work. It makes us all a hell of a lot more negative about politics and politicians. How does that lead to a good outcome for our democracy? Quick answer to your question. We are going to see a blizzard of ads. We won't see as much spent as we did in the 2012 recall election. That was, by our count, about $81 million. We will see more than, than the record for a regular election, which was $36.5 million in 2010. So it's going to be, the overall spending is going to be somewhere, I think, between 36 and a half and $81 million. Uh, there's going to be a blizzard of ads. Uh, I think people will try to escape them in, in every creative way that they can. Uh, and that will lead the politicians to actually run more of the ads um, in more different places like Xbox because they're trying to sneak up on people and expose them to their message when people are trying to flee. And, and steer clear of those ads, so that, that does drive up the cost of, of campaigning. Um, as for the outcome, your guess is as good as mine. I don't have a good enough crystal ball. Uh, I, think it's, I, think it's, uh, I think it's anybody's race. Um, I, I will say this, I've never seen a politician uh, with as high a floor but as low a ceiling as Scott Walker. Um, it's difficult for me to imagine Scott Walker doing anything and getting less than 47 or 48 percent of the vote. I also have a hard time seeing him do anything that could get him above 52 or 53 percent of the vote. And I've never seen a politician like that. I mean, Tommy Thompson could run up 60, 65 percent of the vote. And, and th this governor has a really high floor and a really low ceiling. What that suggests to me is that we're, you're going to see an election come down to a percentage point or two. Now, one way that could be uh, at a point you have to be litigated because it's so close. Well, you never know. I mean, obviously, if, if it's that close, if it comes down to a few hundred or a few thousand votes, then yeah, then it. So we could be the next floor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, but you know, I, I think more than likely, it's one of those things that's you know. 51 49 or 50 and a half 49 and a half that kind of thing or, or you know 52 48 what I can't foresee is a 60 40 outcome or even 55 45 that and and I, I don't know if I can remember I, I don't know if I can remember a single politician where that was the case where the floor was so very high and the ceiling was so very low that's a peculiar phenomenon uh, but he, he is a very polarizing figure. What do you think the amount of money that's going to be in legislative race in both parties and uh, assembly and the Senate? How much money do you think is going to be spent? Um, you know, we've we've already put out some reports on fundraising so far, and and um, interest, it, interestingly, you know, it's uh, it's going to be record-breaking amounts in in the many millions of dollars, uh, and and it's surprising to me that we might see legislative spending records. Because think about what they're competing with. They're competing with a statewide race for governor, another for attorney general. 
they're, they're competing with uh, some very tough races for Congress around the country. So there's a lot of races higher up on the ballot that are siphoning a lot of money. So it's astonishing to me that, that these big donors have enough money to also funnel so much money to state legislative races to actually break records. The only records we won't see broken are the recall election records. So how much outside money have you seen that's come in from legislative races at this point? Huge amounts. Uh, you know, there's both, there's both the direct donations from out-of-state interests that's a growing phenomenon in Wisconsin elections. But then there's also the, the outside groups that come in and sponsor their own advertising. We're seeing very heavy advertising by an outfit called Right Direction Wisconsin, which is an arm of the National Republican Governors Association. We're seeing really heavy advertising on the Democratic side by Greater Wisconsin Committee. A bunch of their money comes from out of state. We're seeing really heavy activity by groups like American Federation for Children, also uh, a group with, with a national agenda and, and a national base. Um, and there are Wisconsin, and if you look at the number of donors, um, we are talking, and I mean to all politicians, we're talking about a number roughly equal to 2% of that population. So what that means is that, is that politicians are really taking their cues from and feeling obliged to cater to a very tiny universe of people, many of whom don't even live in this state. And for the rest of the five and a half million people, it means that they don't get their voices heard the way that they should be heard, and they don't get their interests served the way they should be served. Um, so I, I think regardless of party, uh, ordinary voters end up being the losers in this system. And it's why, it's why people um, actually have much more in common. You, you know, you Democrats may feel you don't have much of anything in common with Republicans. You got something really important in common with, with, with Republican voters. They, they are, are not being listened to the way they should be either. And their communities are not being represented the way they should be either. And um, boy, I tell you, you know, you go to western Wisconsin with the sand mining issue, an awful lot of people in Republican towns, Republican voters, who are who are, are just terrified about what's happening in their own backyard and they don't feel they have any control over it. And, and so, you know, and there again, we follow the money and we saw a 2100% spike in six years in sand mining money into Wisconsin uh, political campaigns. Six, in, in a six year period of time, 2100% more money came from sand mining and and uh, and you know the the state is basically allowing these companies to do as they please out there, with very little oversight, with with virtually no regulation. We saw mining legislation push, and and uh, you know that that bill encountered enormous resistance from voters, and yet it sailed right through and was signed into law. And I couldn't help but notice that there was about $16 million in campaign contributions from pro-mining interests and about $25,000 in campaign contributions from anti-mining interests. Pro-mining interests gave 610 times as much money as, as anti-mining interests. And I think that said a lot about why that legislation passed so far, so fast. Even though you had counties and townships up in that area passing resolutions saying we don't want this, stop it, let's have a moratorium. And, and yet it sailed right through. And I couldn't help but notice that. And then I couldn't help but notice that we accounted for $16 million in pro-mining money. And then the John Doe investigation records get released and we find out about this huge $700,000 donation that was made in secret by the mining company that was totally invisible. That would have made a difference in the mining debate, I would think. I, probably wouldn't change the vote, but it certainly would have changed the whole conversation if people had known about that at the time. But of course, it was kept secret. So, so you know, what I could identify was a 610 to 1 advantage for the pro-mining side. That wasn't even counting the dark money that we couldn't see and couldn't uh, account for until 
we got these records released by the court. Um, to me, to me, voters of every political stripe end up being the losers when, when money becomes the center of the political universe. That, that's a dangerous condition and, and ought to be something that, that unites us just as blue jeans do. Yeah? Another topic. Yeah. Uh, I heard that the, or, there's going to be a $1.8 million budget deficit. Mm -hmm. Where is that from, and is that going to come to bite you off? But, you know, um, it's hard to say whether it'll bite Walker. Uh, it's definitely not good news in, in, in the waning days of an election campaign to, to have, have, a, have word go out there that, that the state now has a deficit. Um, but, you know, if, if he's reelected, it does give him a strong justification to, to go even further than he's gone up to now in, in uh, in, in some of the in, in some of his policies, both uh, both curtailing public employee uh, compensation and then also cutting cutting spending that he wants to cut because he can again say that, that the state faces a, a fiscal crisis. So I mean, it could cut both ways for him. It could be something that is beneficial to him as far as advancing a political agenda. It also could could cost him some votes here in the short term, running up to the election. So it's hard to hard to say, but. I mean, you know, we, we had a projected surplus, uh, and then the governor and legislature chose to give some of that money away, and then the economy started to become more sluggish, and revenue collections started to, to wane, and, and all of a sudden we now have a projected deficit. So, um, you know, that, there again, and I've seen it from both parties, it's really hard for politicians to, to uh, Resist the temptation to to throw out some tax cut or, or or do something with 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 money that's sitting in the bank if they if they have it available to them and and uh, and then the Republicans in the legislature and Walker certainly did that. Well, you know, I think you're you're saying things that we all agree with, and but you haven't given us a solution. We don't have anybody in our legislature that's got any backbone. Stand up and see what's wrong. And, sure, I, and I'm just telling you that I think our only hope is to beat Walker. We've got to be beat Walker. Well, you know, I guess what I would say to that is is that every election counts, and every election matters, and every election has implications and consequences. So, of course, the outcome of this election is really important. But if Walker is, is elected or if he's defeated, we still have a system that is rigged against us. But at least we can call up behind someone. I think the solution is for citizens. You know, one of the things I get a lot, I, I go around and I talk, and you know, if you talk to Republicans, they'll say, well, you know, Rand Paul or John Huntsman, they're the answer. And you talk to more liberal audiences, and they say, well, Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, aren't they the answer? I, I really think that we're making a mistake if we look at any one political official as the answer to our problem. When, when real transformational change occurred, citizens made it happen. And, and my experience is that, is that politicians, we all, we all talk, we speak of them as leaders. We refer to them as our community's leaders, or our state's leaders, or our nation's leaders. I actually have not, I haven't seen too many classes of people less involved with leadership than politicians. When you really think about it, politicians are supposed to take their cues from voters. They're now taking their cues primarily from donors, but they're supposed to take their cues from voters. And so the leadership is supposed to come from the citizenry. And when you look at most issues, uh, take, take uh, marriage equality, gay rights, for example. Barack Obama wasn't for gay marriage. Thus, he could support with civil unions. And the Republicans were absolutely one man, one woman, until a critical mass of public opinion was reached, and most Americans grew comfortable with the idea of gay marriage. And all of a sudden, the Democrats say, we're for gay marriage. 
And the Republicans are saying, our views really don't matter anymore. It doesn't really matter what we think. That's what Walker says now. My, my position isn't, isn't relevant. Now, were they leading when they, when they came to these conclusions? Eh, they were following. They were taking their cues from public opinion. And, and the solution has to come from the citizenry. And what I'm suggesting is that I think we've reached an historic moment where dusting off some of the practices and tactics of past generations and compelling change within the parties is, is necessary. And regardless of the outcome of this particular election, we're still going to have a system that's rigged against us. And it will be rigged, it will be rigged against whoever tries to represent our interests. And, and so I think that the change needs to run much deeper than the outcome of a single race or a, or a single election. Right now, we're going to be focused on that one single race. Let's win that one. Our, I don't know how we try to beat money. That's what I think. It will, it will be a long, hard fight that has to be citizen driven. And you know, there is, there is a movement spreading across the country. 16 states have gone on record. Well over 500 communities have taken a position. A lot of those communities are Republican strongholds. In, in Scott Walker's hometown, in his home of birth, uh, super majority said that the Constitution has to be amended, money in politics has to be addressed. His current community, Wauwatosa, super majority said, amend the Constitution, get rid of money in politics. Waukesha, one of the most conservative places in Wisconsin, a supermajority said, amend the Constitution, deal with money and politics. Fort Atkinson, the hometown of the Fitzgerald brothers, our current Senate majority leader. Again, a, a, you know, 60, 65, 70% of voters are saying, amend the Constitution. So this cuts across party lines. And, and that movement is going to have to continue to build. It's going to have to, you, you go back just a couple of years, and there was, there was a first, I remember, the very first vote in the country it happened to be in the city of Madison. Now over 500 communities have voted in 16 states. Um, that, that movement has to grow and, and it will take years to do it, but eventually politicians will be forced to come where the people are. How many of them are uh, this election? Right. Well, there's, in Wisconsin, there, I think there's 13 more communities that are having votes. And they're in all kinds of places, Republican and Democratic strongholds alike. And, and um, you know, and again, I think it's about citizens uh, demonstrating where they are, wh where they stand, and what they're for, and then compelling the politicians to come back to where they are. Uh, right now, the politicians are very comfortable with the status quo. They are very, they're, they're very embedded in this, in this money game. So uh, Give us a, a, a rough draft of that uh, constitutional amendment. What it basically says is that money is not speech and that corporations are not people with the same constitutional rights as, as human beings. And that as a result, Congress and also the state can make laws regulating money in, in election campaigns. And, and um, the U.S. Supreme Court in very recent years has ruled that money equals speech. They have also held that corporations are citizens with rights under the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment. Um, and that means that there can be no limit placed on the amount of money that they pour into campaigns. What this constitutional amendment says is it, it, is, it, it is permissible to limit the amount of money in campaigns because money is not speech. And, corporations are not people. Um, that's the essence of the amendment. There are many different incarnations of the amendment. One fairly weak uh, uh, incarnation was just voted on in the U.S. Senate. And on party lines, the filibuster could not be broken. A majority of senators voted for it, but they couldn't reach 60 votes and break the filibuster. I actually think it was too early to take this to Congress. Uh, I think Congress will only come once it is so apparent that there is such a massive parade. And whenever politicians see a parade, they run to the front and they grab a drum or a flag. 
if, if they realize that there's such a massive parade, they'll get to the front of that parade. But not until there is a really massive parade. So I think, I, I personally think it was premature. Some, some reformers were celebrating the vote in Congress. I, I actually think that the work has to be done in the streets and in, and in neighborhoods um, in, and, and not in, in the halls of Congress at this point. They, they, they're wedded to the political money game and, and we, have to, we have to compel them to, to come to where we are. And that's that's going to be hard work. Yeah. yeah. I've heard that the overall state debt is was around ten billion dollars when our governor became governor, and it's now near fourteen billion. Have you got any? We. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me. What I can tell you is that the state is is relying much much more heavily on borrowing. And, and that's a way to be able to lend the appearance that we're, we're cutting spending or that we're holding the line on spending. And what we're, what we're doing is instead of paying as we go, we're putting it on a credit card. And so state bonding, state debt is, is growing at a fairly alarming rate. Even as politicians are saying that we're, that we're creating really lean budgets, they're there, and we're holding the line on taxes, and we're even cutting, you know, we're even throwing you a bone here and there and, and, and offering up a tax cut. Uh, but then uh, at the same time, they're really expanding state bonding. Um, I'm not enough of an expert to know when you reach a perilous threshold, what level of state bonding we start to really put in jeopardy our, our, uh, our credit rating and, and all of that kind of thing. I, I'm not enough of an expert on, on fiscal affairs to know that. I do know that bonding is, is way out of line with what it's traditionally been in Wisconsin. Uh, but what the, what the trouble zone is, I don't know. I don't know how high it has to get to the peril facts. We gotta let people go home. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. Thank Appreciate you. it.